Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chanel, and welcome to today's webinar. We're pleased to have Dr. Andrew Heyman, Dr. Andrew Pugelis, Dr. Sahar Swedan, and Dr. James Laval with us today. Each speaker is a recognized expert within the anti-aging world, and together they are kicking off the first week of our COVID-19 Resource Hub. Today, they will provide an overview of COVID-19, including the current state of affairs within the U.S., the known aspects of the illness, and current knowledge surrounding treatment options. They'll stop at the end of their presentation to take any questions you may have. Please feel free to submit your questions in the chat box of your control panel at any time during the presentation. To our panelists, thank you for joining us today. Great, thanks everyone. Um, this is Dr. Andrew Heyman. I really appreciate the support of A4M to launch our education series on such an important topic, uh, something that of course we're thinking about every day. And I would imagine many of us are fielding questions by concerned patients. And sometimes we have good answers, sometimes we don't have good answers. There's a lot that we're learning about the virus. There's a lot that we still don't know. And we thought it would be prudent to take a, uh, a longitudinal perspective on uh, beginning to work through some of the more important aspects of um, what we do know about this virus and how we can support you as providers uh, to get you good information on the subject. And equally as importantly, uh, the dual purpose of this uh, education series is to put some tools and resources in your hands that you can then distribute to your patients. So for example, we've written a letter um, that is patient specific. It reviews the um, basic topics related to the virus, addresses some treatment related issues, We'll be distributing that to each of you this week. And it's something that you can put your logo on as well. Uh, you can put your name to. We encourage you, if you haven't sent a letter like this to your patients, to please distribute it to them. Uh, we found that uh, patients are very thankful when uh, they're getting additional support and resources in their hands that they might not be getting from just a conventional provider. Of course, there's lots of questions about how can I better protect myself? How can I increase the uh, efficiency of my immune system? And what do I do if I get sick? So we'll be covering all of those issues and more throughout the course of these eight weeks. Uh, and I really wanna thank each of you for attending today. Um, I know this is an uncertain time and hopefully uh, you'll get a lot out of this experience over the next two months with us. Um, so uh, what's going to be included in this education series? Generally, we want to raise awareness about COVID-19 um, and its population-based impact. Um, and that means both for you and your patient base. Uh, one of the things I would encourage you to do is to actually invite your patients to attend these webinars moving forward. Today really is for our practitioner base, but we want to make sure that we're getting good information out not just to our community of practitioners, uh, but also to those patients uh, that they treat. So to that end, uh, we want to help the public understand what they can do to remain as healthy as possible during this uncertain period of time. Uh, we'll also have uh, different weeks where we look at various treatment options, either methods to boosting the immune system, treatment for active COVID infections, and then we're going to end the entire eight weeks with a Patient Summit. So this is uh, the topics that we'll be reviewing over the course of the two months. Today is an overview, and it's meant to orient you as practitioners to the state of affairs of the virus and some key points that you can share with your patients as well uh, as we sort of field questions from them moving forward. Week two, we'll look at how do we deal with acute symptoms. And of course, so much of what we'll be talking about are you know, non-FDA approved treatments, but we feel have good evidence and good science behind them to mitigate symptoms, reduce viral load, and ultimately, hopefully prevent people from progressing to either hospitalization and or requirement for ventilator uh, management. That would always be our goal in that regard. Week three, 
will be reviewing natural immune boosters, and you have to be careful here. There are a variety of compounds that actually um, potentially stimulate the cytokine storm, so they're not all equal uh, with respect to what's safe and potentially efficacious. Weeks four, five, and six, we'll be getting into the lifestyle-related issues. What can patients do to remain healthy while they're quarantined or sequestered. This is a very difficult time on people physically as well as emotionally. There are high levels of stress and uncertainty. We know many of our patients are potentially losing their jobs or their jobs are uh, being threatened. Uh, there are already reports of heightened depression and a sense of social, social isolation that we need to address effectively. And then by week six, giving them some stress management tools um, that we feel are effective uh, to get them moving, breathing, reduce their stress levels, um, and mitigate the uh, social isolation. Uh, week seven, we'll focus on promising new therapies for COVID. This will go beyond weeks uh, two and three, um, and we'll take some time looking at what is the near and far future hold for exciting options for treatment, and then finally, uh, we'll end week eight with a patient summit where we want to open up uh, our faculty to uh, the general patient population that um, all of you treat and field some important questions that they might have. So the states of health or disease are the expressions of the success or failure experienced by the organism in its efforts to respond adaptively to environmental challenges. And I think this quote really encapsulates the spirit of the A4M approach, which is to say, how do we strengthen the host? How do we strengthen the immune system in the face of vectors and immune threats? I think we're quite well positioned in that regard. I can tell you, I just had a important discussion on Monday with the lead clinical research team at Kaiser Permanente. They are running some large scale randomized control trials for uh, drug antivirals, uh, often uh, uh, inserted later into the course of therapy when a patient is already quite sick or even on a ventilator, but they fully admitted that they just don't have a lot of treatment options for patients that might have mild symptoms but are at high risk for progression. I think uh, that's where we fit in, our approach of uh, increasing resiliency, increasing immu immune status, making sure that patients are as healthy as possible to resist progression. Uh, we have a lot of answers there that uh, our uh, more conventional colleagues uh, just don't really focus on in their day-to-day. -day. So what's a bit of the state of affairs right now? Uh, COVID-19, uh, basically the 19 stands for the year that it was uh, originally identified or diagnosed as a human problem. Uh, it was um, it's been caused by a, an acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. It's a beta coronavirus, and its original uh, host is bats. There was a early um, mutation in the virus that allowed it to escape the bat and enter the human population. And as many of you know, uh, that can be a disaster uh, for people. This is what causes pandemics when uh, a vector is introduced and there's no native immunity. Uh, there could be some secondary hosts as well, such as the pangolin, uh, and we're quite certain that it originated in Wuhan, China, in one of their uh, wet markets. Um, the first published case was December 31st in the literature, although, of course, there are some reports going back earlier that, than that into November and maybe even before uh, for the first identified cases. In January 7th, um, it was confirmed. Um, in China that uh, they identify person-to-person -person transmission. At the time, they were reporting that this virus was not uh, moving from uh, individual to individual in a very efficient way, but of course, uh, we now know that that's not true. And eventually, it was declared as a pandemic on uh, March 11th. Um, as of a couple days ago, we know about 1.6 million people have been infected globally. Uh, the U.S. passed China and Italy on March 26 to have the most uh, cases. Uh, now this number is much, much higher. It's amazing when you uh, look away from this uh, number of cases in the U.S. and look back a day or two later how much higher it is. Um, our death toll is now closer to 20,000, um, over 3% death rate worldwide. That's a number that we do pay attention to, which is to say how lethal 
is this virus. And millions and millions and millions of Americans are now claiming unemployment because of the devastating impact that we all know that this is happening um, on our economy. And of course, we have to both deal with the medical related issues to slow the spread, develop treatments and develop a vaccine uh, on the public health side, and also try and come up with methods uh, to reopen the economy effectively without creating any additional risk. It's a very difficult um, set of decisions to make. And I'm sure we're all watching closely uh, how that's happening. Uh, we know the transmission is primarily respiratory in the initial contact phases. Uh, we can have a relatively asymptomatic period of time, uh, even up to 12 days or so. Unfortunately, the course of illness itself uh, can be relatively mild too, in terms of slight fever, dry cough, uh, that might unfortunately for some patients progress quite quickly to a form of respiratory distress, although it's not currently being classified as a typical ARD situation. Um, I've spoken with a couple of respiratory therapists who talk about it's almost as if patients are drowning um, uh, when they um, enter the, the, the sickest phases of, of this illness. Uh, we do think too that potentially there could be transmission through uh, fecal contamination that might in fact be persistent once the patient has um, moved beyond the acute phase and potentially that could be days or even weeks. So there's a greater concern now growing in terms of um, how long a person might be spreading the virus and through what routes overall. Um, for most people, the symptoms are mild um, and who uh, ends up uh, with uh, a progression versus resolution depends mostly on age and other underlying risk factors. Although of course there are case reports now of younger people succumbing uh, to the illness too, unfortunately. Uh, but overall, most of the deaths are in age 65 or older, um, and um, uh, certainly the, the statistics are even worse in the um, oldest populations. So I want to thank you very much uh, for spending your time with us today. Uh, we have a very nice lineup of experts, um, some of you who know, you know them, um, but we also have one of our own um, Dr. Pugliese, who is a infectious disease specialist and also A4M trained, uh, I'm delighted to have him uh, go over some more details of the uh, virus itself. And don't forget, we'll all be present at the end of this discussion to answer some questions that you might have in the last uh, uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, I, I really strongly encourage you to help promote this series to your patients, to your friends and family, this is not just for you, this is for the public as well. We wanna make sure that we get information out to as many people as possible for our perspective on ways to sort of uh, manage uh, the virus and stay as healthy as possible um, during these uncertain times. So thank you so much for uh, being here with us. Okay, um, Maya? Yes. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Andrew Puglisi. I'm an infectious, as Dr. Heyman said, I'm an infectious disease specialist. Um, I'm gonna be just talking uh, about an overview of where we are with COVID-19 as of today, because as you can all uh, understand, this is evolving as we're going along. Um, so what do we know about it from an epidemiologic point of view and who gets infected and who is going to be more symptomatic than others? Uh, as of today, it looks like 80 to 85 percent of the people that get infected with COVID-19 uh, will have mild to moderate symptoms. About 15 percent of the population will require hospitalization, and then of the grand total, about 5 percent will require intensive care therapy. Um, when you look at the reproductive number, how this virus uh, acts as opposed to seasonal influenza, where um, our the reproductive no number for COVID is almost double of what it is for influenza. So what does that mean? It means that more than likely, twice as many people can be infected from COVID-19 as opposed to uh, what you would see with uh, influenza, which we do see on a, a 
annual basis. Um, these are just some of the numbers that show the uh, percent of COVID cases that we've seen in the United States since uh, January 21st of this year. As you can see, there was a little bit of a spike and then it kind of decreased with time until the end of February. Then we saw a significant increase in the number of cases of COVID. Now, there are some caveats to this. One is, as testing became more available and people were recognizing more symptomatology, more and more patients were being tested for the virus. That, as we can see now with time, that the actual number of uh, percent increases is actually decreasing with time, mostly due to what we have been doing here in the United States, sheltering in place, mitigation, um, you know, uh, which had, of course, we're concerned with the economy, where things are going after this. But for right now, it looks like we've had a really great impact on slowing down the progression of this virus. Uh, moving along to, from an immunologic point of view, and what we're seeing today is that it takes about five to seven days for the host to develop antibodies to the virus. Uh, so uh, what we're seeing here is an immunofluorescence of the antibodies that develop in the saliva. Uh, this is five days post onset. And then look by day 17, 100% of the patients tested will have antibodies. And that is one of the problems that we are seeing here with this virus is that there is a significant time frame involved in the development of antibodies which can neutralize the virus. So the most recent data on this says about by day seven, about 50% of the patients will develop antibodies. And by day 14, 100% of the patients will develop antibodies. Uh, just to take it a step further, this is another slide showing the antibody production for uh, COVID-19. Um, interestingly enough, uh, with other uh, viruses, there's usually a spike initially in the IgM, which is gonna be your early um, onset system. Uh, for uh, combating a virus. And then the IgG, which is your memory type cells, will increase uh, later on. With COVID-19, what we have found is basically there is a simultaneous elevation of both IgM and IgG. Uh, we still haven't, you know, because this is so new, we still don't know how long IgM will last and where the IgG will go uh, uh, months from now. So again, this is just evolving as we are dealing with this pandemic right now. Um, let's talk about um, how this virus affects us. Well, the main receptor that uh, COVID-19 uh, infects is known as the ACE2 receptors, angiotensin-converting uh, angiotensin enzyme 2. That is the receptor that seems COVID-19 likes to adhere to. Um, it is predominantly found in the lungs, which then explains why we see so much respiratory symptoms here. However, it is also found in the heart and digestive tract, and also in the um, olfactory uh, system. And uh, this probably explains why we see in certain individuals um, other than the what I would consider the typical uh, presentation you would see with viruses. And we'll talk about more of this later. Um, now, as far as also uh, COVID-19 appears like it can affect red blood cells. And in this uh, appears that the glycoproteins and certain proteins of COVID-19 actually can uh, bind to uh, the um, heme molecule 
and disrupt the iron from uh, forming porphyrin. And because of this, there is less heme, and this can decrease the ability for uh, oxygen to be carried and uh, carbon dioxide to be carried from red blood cells. So that is a, a bit of a concern as a secondary, uh, as another mechanism of how um, COVID-19 affects humans. Um, we also uh, have this malaria COVID connection in association with uh, uh, COVID-19 right now. And this is one of the reasons why chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine has been effective in using, um, in treating COVID-19. I'm not gonna uh, belabor this too much because I know uh, Dr. Sahar is gonna be talking about treatments. Also, uh, we see some of this favorable uh, with the protease inhibitors that uh, are out there uh, that they're doing research right now. Um, one of the interesting things that I always find is the cytokine storm, uh, which can occur, and this is just a severe immune reaction. Um, and again, if you do have these cytokine storms, it can create a little, uh, significant amount of inflammation in your body. And that inflammation, especially if it occurs in the lungs, can uh, also uh, inhibit uh, oxygen exchange. And this is why in some patients we are seeing uh, the requirements of ventilator use uh, to um, uh, sit them through this insult. Uh, what are the typical symptoms that are associated with this? Are cough, fever, tiredness, difficulty breathing. That is part of the problem. And uh, in that you can take almost any other respiratory illness out there that is a viral origin and you'll have the same uh, symptomatology. Um, when we look at a differential diagnosis uh, in association with viruses, uh, here are some of the other ones that can cause similar symptoms, influenza, RSV, para-influenza virus, human meta-pneumonia virus, uh, pneumovirus, I should say. Um, I actually had that five years ago. It is a nasty virus, uh, very similar to what people have been experiencing with COVID-19 and adenoviruses. Uh, there are certain bacterial infections that uh, can mimic COVID-19. These include strep pneumonia, H. flu, uh, uh, Moraxella catarralis, and then we also have to be aware of the atypical bacterial pneumonias that can present like viral pneumonias. These include mycoplasm pneumoniae and Legionella. Uh, one of the problems that I've been facing here in Georgia is that uh, COVID-19 has coincided with what we call pollen season. Uh, today, for example, the pollen count is 2,000. Uh, two weeks ago, it was 13,000. Uh, I have a lot of patients that have been coming in lately with respiratory complaints, uh, low-grade fevers, uh, coryza, rhinitis. Um, uh, so it is hard to distinguish whether or not this is pollen-related or is this uh, truly related to COVID-19. For many of my patients that I've been following for years, it has pretty much been, you know, this is the time of year where they are suffering. So uh, I evaluate them differently than somebody coming in who doesn't have uh, problems with pollen. Uh, there are some atypical um, uh, presentations that have been associated with uh, COVID-19 that I wanna talk about that. Uh, digestive issues, apparently about 3% of people with COVID-19, their presenting complaint has been uh, diarrhea. Another one is the loss of taste and smell. Uh, again, in both of these, you have to wonder if it is related to the ACE2 receptors that may be found uh, maybe in a little bit of a higher concentration in these individuals. Malaise, confusions, myalgias, arthralgias, headaches and dizziness, yes. Uh, these can be seen with other viruses. 
Now, what are the populations at risk? Well, if you have underlying lung disease, such as COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, of course, uh, asthma, you're going to have to be put into a different category since this uh, virus attacks the lungs specifically. And um, if you already have an inflammatory response going on in the lungs and you are now infected with COVID-19, it is like adding uh, fuel to the fire. Uh, patients that have immunologic uh, dysfunctions, um, such as HIV, uh, uh, also run the risk of uh, being more susceptible to COVID-19. Now, there is a caveat to this, uh, especially if you have HIV patients that are currently on therapy, well-controlled, and especially if they are on a protease inhibitor, it is possible that they are protective against COVID. Uh, that is more of a theory than anything, but uh, when you look at the science, that can make sense. Uh, if you have underlying cancers, of course, that makes sense that you're immunocompromised. Here's something interesting, the severe obesity. Uh, John Abel, who's a colleague of mine who does a lot of work down in um, South Georgia, uh, one of the epicenters at Albany um, with COVID-19 at uh, Phoebe, Memorial, uh, apparently most, if not all of the patients with COVID-19 that are intubated are obese. Uh, this segues into whether or not you have some underlying chronic illnesses that are not well controlled, such as diabetes, kidney disease, or liver disease. Uh, this can have uh, a negative impact if you become uh, infected with COVID-19. You also have to raise some questions about see, uh, some of the um, data that's coming out about lower socioeconomic areas uh, with patients that may have a lot of these underlying diseases that are not well managed. Pregnancy. Um, for those of you who were involved with the epidemic of H1N1 back in 2009, uh, I know specifically uh, we had a number of not only women that of childbearing years that were in the ICU on ventilators because of H flu uh, because of influenza, but uh, we ha also had several women that were pregnant and wound up delivering uh, their babies in the ICU. Um, what are some of the complications? Again, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome has been seen uh, in these patients. Uh, as Dr. Heyman pointed out, it may not be ARDS specifically, uh, but uh, there is uh, quite a bit of inflammation that occurs in the lungs. Irregular heart rates, arrhythmia, uh, myocarditis, my myopathies have been seen. Again, we have to wonder if this is in relationship to the ACE2 receptors. Um, but again, in general, viruses have been known to cause myocarditis and uh, myopathies. Uh, cardiovascular collapse. Um, again, I'm always concerned whenever we have cardiovascular collapse. Uh, if this is due to, let's say, a cytokine storm where there is just an overwhelming amount of inflammation occurring that is having a negative impact on the vascular system. From a neurologic point of view, apparently we've had a couple of case studies now of Guillain-Barre uh, and encephalitis being seen. Uh, this, again, is, has been seen with other viruses. This is an autoimmune process. Uh, and again, there are treatments for the Guillain-Barre syndrome. So uh, as time goes on, it will not be surprising if we see more uh, neurologic manifestations associated with COVID-19. Abnormal blood clots. Um, there have been some reports of abnormal uh, patients with COVID-19 developing blood clot formation. Again, you have to wonder how this is related to possibly um, COVID-19 getting into red blood cells. But again, uh, my more concern is whether or not the cytokine storms, uh, increased inflammation um, may be a contributing factor uh, to creating abnormal blood uh, clots. Again, where do we see abnormal blood clots? Well, patients with all other autoimmune diseases like lupus. And um, again, 
this raises the question uh, with these patients that we're seeing all of these uh, complications, is there some genetic predisposition, especially uh, as Ann, uh, Dr. Heyman uh, uh, stated earlier, that we are seeing young people now without medical histories that are uh, having severe complications with this disease. Um, just want to talk about proning. Um, apparently, proning has been uh, reviewed um, earlier. Uh, back, uh, this was uh, an article I found from 2013, uh, 2013 on it, and uh, uh, based on some research that was done on ARDS back in 2010. Um, apparently, it takes a pandemic to people to implement some of these things when uh, your arsenal is starting to run short. And um, basically, it's taking a patient, putting them on their stomach. This allows for better blood flow and oxygenation to the posterior portion of the lung, which is where most of your lung is found, lungs are found, uh, so that whatever is capable of working can work more efficiently. Uh, again, um, proning has been shown to work with this, and uh, some clinicians are now, upon discharge of their patients that have been intubated, they're uh, recommending to continue proning while they're home, at home convalescing. Genetic predisposition, uh, I'm going to talk just briefly about the ACE receptors, HLA mutations, and cytokines storms and what we know so far. Uh, apparently, some people may have more um, um, ACE2 uh, receptors that may be more susceptible to um, the virus, and that's why we're seeing some people having a more profound effect when they get infected with uh, COVID-19, especially in the younger population. Um, this was something interesting. They're looking at HLA uh, different types, and basically they have found that um, there are some HLA types that may have a more of an immunologic response to COVID-19 as opposed to other HLA groups. Uh, the cytokine storm, apparently uh, there have been found, there are, are beginning to look at some uh, subpopulations that have a more profound cytokine storm response to COVID-19, uh, which can uh, contribute to the severity of their symptoms. And what about testing? Uh, so moving on to testing. Uh, PCR right now is our mainstay. Um, and uh, there have been some problems. Initially, we were looking more at nasal swabs. Uh, we're finding now that uh, the accuracy the, uh, of the nasal swabs may not be as good as, let's say, saliva and sputum. Uh, so we're uh, looking to do more uh, nasal pharyngeal testing and initially we're concerned now that there may have been a certain amount of false negatives associated with this. Uh, testing is getting better. Uh, the performers of the testing are more proficient now. So uh, it is felt that we are getting more accurate readings. That being said is there is still concern that we may have some cross reactivity with other coronaviruses uh, if, if there are present, have been present in your body. Um, serial testing is being developed. There have been some uh, small groups uh, that are doing uh, serologic testing right now. Uh, I think going forward, this is going to be an important concept because we're still trying to figure out how many people may have been infected with this virus and were not symptomatic. Uh, the ranges that I've seen concerning the, uh, that population that is asymptomatic, uh, the range has been anywhere from 10% to 50%. So going forward, serologic testing, I think, will be extremely important to see not only who has it now, but also who uh, had had it in the past and were completely unaware of this. 
Um, and, and so um, that is what we're seeing. That is it uh, for me. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm going to briefly review some of the treatments and with the preface, as you guys know, nothing has been really approved by the FDA specifically for COVID-19. Some of the treatments, though, have been under the emergency use and approved, uh, and I will highlight some of those in the state of affairs of some of the treatments. This is going to be a very high-level overview, and uh, please remember that in week two, we will be diving much deeper, myself and Dr. Wecker, um, into the various treatments um, and the pros and cons and really some of the clinical trials. So. What do we have uh, really right now? Um, like I said, we're just gonna do the 30,000 level of initial treatments, review the potential mechanism of action with COVID-19, and really some of the other future studies that are ongoing. Of course, we cannot escape without talking about the most debated, uh, probably current drug right now is hydroxychloroquine. Obviously, as you guys know, really in the media, um, you know, touted from the initial in vitro trials that um, it was shown to block the viral entry into the cells by inhibiting, you know, the glycosylation of the host receptors. And obviously, you know, by Dr. Um, Mr. Trump and touted as the potential treatment for COVID-19. So what is hydroxychloroquine? As many of you guys know and have probably used it in many of your patients for a variety of illnesses, mainly malaria and autoimmune. Um, it was shown in vitro to have good antiviral in slowing the replication of the virus in vitro of COVID-19. So what is the proposed mechanism here? Um, they think kind of similar to malaria, as actually as Dr. Puglisi has mentioned, um, blocking you know, viral entry into the cell through this ACE2 receptor, and then making really the host cell less hospitable to the virus. So a lot of proteolytic processing, endosomal acidification to kind of make the cell intracellularly more hostile for the virus and obviously stop or slow down the replication. Now, as we also know, hydroxychloroquine does have definitely immunomodulatory effects through the attenuation of certain cytokines. As you know, it's mainly used in a lot of autoimmunological rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and others. Um, and it really thought to do this, obviously, by modulating this immunomodulatory cytokine production uh, response and uh, and so could it possibly early on, you know, if we slow down viral cell entry, slow down viral replication immunomodulate, can we possibly slow down the progression of these susceptible patients that are, you know, with higher risk factors are more susceptible to the serious um, effects of COVID-19. Now, chloroquine was shown to inhibit the SARS-CoV-2, obviously the virus that causes COVID-19 illness. Um, in vitro hydroxychloroquine, which is the cousin of chloroquine, has shown in vitro um, activity, but hydroxychloroquine in general is a bit less toxic and um, less adverse reaction. So what is the current dose? There's many that are out there that you see, depending on the literature, but probably based on pharmacokinetic data and some of the trials that have been available so far, 400 milligrams BID for day one. Sometimes in patients, you will see higher doses like 600 milligram, um, you know, on day one, and then followed by 200 milligrams BID for the next four days. So most of the protocols that you will see in uh, outpatient or, you know, for less um, severe or inpatient, really, it's the 400 milligrams BID for day one and 200 milligrams BID for the next four days. Um, some other ones that you may see, 200 milligrams TID for five days, 200 milligrams BID for 10 days. Now, the big concern here, obviously, is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine may potentially cause QT prolongation. So there is the risk of that potentially. So you do want to obviously be careful with that, monitor that, and probably, you know, weigh the risk versus benefits in patients that have QT prolongation syndromes 
or on concomitant medications that prolong the QT interval. Hypoglycemia can potentially happen, so we have to monitor uh, patients that are on, obviously, antihypoglycemics. And probably the main effect of that, honestly, is the anti-inflammatory immunomodulatory effect of the drug. Retinal warning, obviously, this can cause retinopathy, but it, mainly this is really an effect of longer-term use, potentially neuropsychiatric effects of the drug. So we really don't have, you know, the typical clean trials that we look for, you know, randomized, multi-center, um, placebo-controlled, all the good stuff that we're used to. But right now, you know, we're flying, we're doing a lot of stuff on the fly because we haven't seen anything like this and we're trying, you know, I say we're into just save patients mode right now. So as you know, the two popular ones that have been debated are the ones that came out of China and came out of um basically um, in in uh, France, you know, so in this one, they looked at hydroxychloroquine, 100 milligrams TID for 10 days, and they basically um, was really general, you know, inclusion if patients were in the hospital with COVID-19, and then they were treated, basically, they had to be 12 years or older. And basically, their primary endpoint was to look at viral clearance um, at day six. And this was really typical patients, you know, and I think as Dr. Him and Dr. Piglisi mentioned, you know, before we used to think, well, this is mainly going to affect and make really older patients, comorbid conditions really sick. But unfortunately, we are seeing, you know, young, healthy people succumb to this illness. And, and so you do see definitely younger patients. So in the control group, slightly younger 51 years of age on the hydroxychloroquine, and they basically ranged anywhere from asymptomatic that were positive to some of the obviously more complicated. And as you can see, basically the time of onset of symptoms, and then when they got onto the trial was roughly four days. Uh, this was another trial. Um, so this was the original quick one. It was only in 36 patients. Then they followed it up with a longer um, or not longer, but a bigger trial, 80 patients, um, basically single center, observational, single arm. And again, these were adults with PCR confirmed SARS-CoV-2, and they received drugs for at least three days with a six days follow-up. And again, and you can see this one, um, some of the patients had the comorbid condition, so you would think they would be potentially sicker. Um, definitely some of them had the comorbid fever that you see. And again, about five days from onset of symptoms till they uh, were placed into the drug trial. And then what they saw is um, in the study, about 12% ended up on oxygen therapy, about 3.8% was transferred to ICU. And then the length of stay in the um, infectious disease was roughly about five days and about four days um, until time to discharge. So the summary of, of both studies really that looked at the hydroxychloroquine and then the famous question we're always asking too is, is azithromycin needed, right? So in the first trial, they also added azithromycin in about six patients. In the second larger publication, we really, they didn't distinguish how many patients were on hydroxychloroquine alone versus hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Um, and so what they showed is that really um, in the second publication, which had you know bigger numbers, 83% um, really improved at day seven and 93% at day eight uh, post-treatment. So definitely these studies had some issues, right? You know, so the inclusion exclusion was not clearly defined, small sample size. Sometimes the viral loads were not measured and there's issues with testing as, as we mentioned also, you know, huge age range, you know, not stratified for disease and things like that. And really we, there is some potential issues, but what, what, what are they telling us from the in vitro and at least initial in vivo data? And also some of the case reports that we're hearing from around the country that probably treat early. Um, you know, some of the hospitals use definitely this protocol. Some have stopped using it. And I really think the problem is with this combination or with this drug, hydroxychloroquine specifically, we really need to use it earlier in the course of illness rather than later, because look how it works. It mainly slows down 
entry into the cell and slows down viral replication and modulates the immune the immune storm possibly and that's why i think it makes more sense that we use it earlier in treatment versus um, later and the hydroxychloroquine effectiveness is encouraging. We definitely have more and more trials that are running across the country looking at prophylactic use of hydroxychloroquine in frontline you know, healthcare workers now, and also looking at the efficacy if used earlier versus later in the day. So obviously be careful of the QTC type side. The other issue is short supply issue, right? This was the big issue with this because everybody started hoarding it, mainly healthcare professionals when they saw the studies. They started prescribing it for themselves and their families and everybody else, which caused some short supply issue for patients, you know, for lupus and um, and so on. So um, another larger trial came out of China, looked at 400 milligram sulfate twice daily on day one, followed by the 200 milligrams. So this is an ongoing study. We just have basically initial uh, initial uh, prelim from the State Council of China that chloroquine phosphate had demonstrated marked efficacy and acceptable safety in treating COVID-19 associated pneumonia in a multi-center clinical trial. Um, so this is the one that we're waiting for the publication, but this is kind of their unofficial statement uh, from the study. And, and so again, these studies are going to be trickling out, you know, uh, lopanavir, ritonavir combination is a combination of antiviral. So again, the World Health Organization, as you know, is running trials with hydroxychloroquine and with the azithromycin and also with lopanavir ritonavir combination. Um, so this one is a study of 199 patients. They were hospitalized adult patients. And again, with decreased oxygen saturation, uh, this cohort would then include mild, moderate, as well as severe hypoxic patients. And with this study, they did not see a difference in mortality at day 28. And there are some adverse reactions. This is really an HIV drug that's used, obviously, as an antiviral. But the question is, again, it did not show difference in, in mortality because, again, I think similar to the hydroxychloroquine story, we really have to look at the mechanism of action of these drugs and study them in the appropriate cohort. So this included mild, moderate, and severe hypoxic patients. So the question is, again, since this is an antiviral and slows down replication, does this make more sense, again, to test in milder cases early on to see if it's effective? And again, we're all, we're all waiting for many trials that are being conducted here in the United States and also around the world with the World Health um, Organization. The other ones that are getting a lot of splashes in the literature is the interleukin-6 blockers. Um, so these are monoclonal antibodies. So tolizumab um, and serolimab are being studied now. Many clinical trials going on in the hospital specifically to, uh, for, you know, um, under clinical trials. So these are interleukin-6 antagonists. And basically the thought is that with this virus, we do see high levels of interleukin uh, a bunch of interleukins, but specifically interleukin-6, and could block and it obviously decrease the cytokine um, storm that we see um, into these patients. Now, we know, as we mentioned, the SARS-CoV-2 depends on the ACE2 receptor for entry. Um, and there was debate, you know, initially, as you know, and really, we still have the debate, patients that are on ACE inhibitors in, Cal in uh, ARP, angiotensile receptor blockers because they upregulate the ACE2 receptor. Is that bad? And could that make people more prone for the penetration of the SARS-2? Now we're looking at really the genetic polymorphism and of the ACE2 and what does that mean? And actually now they're looking at our blockers such as Losartan um, in patients requiring hospitalization to see if that may be a path to block entry of the virus into intracellularly. Some other things that are being looked at, this literally just came off hot off the press yesterday. I was reading it, um, JAMA, April 13. Um, some other things that are being looked at with this, obviously, and we'll dive more into for next week, ribavirin, interferon, alpha and beta. Remdesivir obviously is getting a lot of national attention as the antiviral. It's available in clinical trials and compassionate use. Favipiravir, um, so this one has pretty good 
you know, really it looks like efficacy. It's one antiviral out of Japan. Um, immunoglobulin therapy and, of course, convalescent plasma therapy is also being looked at now. Um, a lot and a lot of clinical trials are ongoing with that also. So, and here's all the references for you if you need them. And thank you for your attention from my part. Hey, great, Sahar, thank you. Um, you know, I'm gonna go through in about five minutes because I know we wanna leave some time for questions. There's another interesting thing. If all of you guys are familiar with nicotinamide riboside, that's also being studied right now because as you get inflammate systemic inflammation going on whether it's metabolic inflammation or acute inflammation from a the you know the the uh covid 19 you, what happens is is that the parp uh substrates are upregulated and you basically destroy your nad uh and which ends up causing these problems in the mitochondria so you end up losing mitochondrial energy and there's actually been some studies being done at NIH with nicotinamide riboside in regards to COVID-19. So uh, just an off track, off, off uh, topic piece. And I know we're gonna go through things for immune support uh, next week, I think I'm on, or the week after. So, uh, you know, we'll get through that. Hey, the big thing guys is, is that we all know people are flipping out. They're anxious. They have worries about their, their uh, you know, what's going on. And that means that they're having trouble either managing their daytime anxiety or it's causing them to have sleep problems. And, they're, and they're, obviously the issues with that are when you start to be anxious and you start to lose sleep, uh, that's gonna create problems in terms of immunity, uh, in terms of cellular repair, and in terms of triggering a baseline of metabolic inflammation known as metaflammation, where we're upregulating things like interleukin-6 and clodin-2 and TGF-beta. So, so I wanna go right to this piece just because of the time. Uh, and, and this is the issue, guys. Daytime hyperarousal with, uh, via emotional and physiologic consequences triggers the sympathetic nervous system to become hyperaroused. So I can't, I mean, I'm still seeing 15, 20 people on my, my heavy days, all virtual. Every person that I talk to, almost to a fault, uh they're they're anxious they're nervous they're concerned on many levels and this triggers that central nervous system uh hyper arousal so they're going through internalization of the emotions maybe they've got their kids at home and they're having to homeschool while they're healthcare professionals probably people on our call right now are experiencing this from we're not used to having your three kids around you all the time and uh and and so this anxiety and internalization can trigger that CNS hyperarousal, which based on obviously genetic variability or vulnerability, um, changes in sleep, where's their hormone balance at with cortisol, uh, the, if, it, if you're menopausal or andropausal, and then people start to rely on things like caffeine, nicotine uh, to get them through that their day. Uh, but even more importantly, people are drinking record levels of alcohol apparently. <laughs> So, uh, so all of this ends up creating a, a cycle of uh, sleep disturbance. And, and, you know, this is one of the key things we can try to do to help people is, can we get them to breathe deep? Can we get them to, to uh, calm their stress down during the course of their day? Can we get them to then re-initiate you know, uh, a circadian rhythm to get them to sleep at night? And so what I want to do for you, I've only got to, uh, I, want to, I want to make sure we get questions. It's so important. Obviously, when your cortisol is up, you block slow wave sleep. And, you, and what happens is, is you increase corticotropin releasing hormone, which ends up triggering, you know, mast cell activation, histamine, leukotrienes. All these things start to happen as your peripheral CRH goes up as well as as your cortisol goes up and then has a direct effect on the gut. I just put together a couple. I've got some supplements here you should think of real quick. First, guys, this is uh, better known as uh, Relora. Nice for improving cortisol balance, restores the circadian rhythm of cortisol, 250 milligrams three times a day. I'll leave these uh, to you to, re to review. I use holy basil when people have their, when they have issues with irritable bowel syndrome and they're stressed out. So people are saying, yeah, my IBS is kicking up. I'm really stressed out. 
you want to include holy basil in that. It, it actually has some very nice studies on it for regulation of the HPA axis, and it's an immunomodulator. I know I'll go through some peptides and things that you can use with the immune supplement support in the next, the following talks, but this is one that's a great immunomodulator as well as something that reduces stress. Um, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm going to go through this pretty quick so we have time for call, for questions. Theanine, this is for the person that perseverates. I give 200 to 400 milligrams three times a day, especially in these times, and and it really helps people because it helps them to re-establish their circadian rhythm and get their alpha wave sleep back. It helps to reduce uh, phenylethylamine production in the brain, which means you're going to perseverate less. They don't get drowsy on it. I use kava, especially in women, because it helps to slow down the stress response in the amygdala. Uh, and so I'll add kava into this as well, and I'll do this during the day and or at night. And I've got some great studies here that were double-blinded in the Corcoran database showing that it was effective. Uh, but typically, it's 250 milligrams of a 30% kavaloctone extract three times a day. Now, uh, you can do it twice a day. You can do it just at bedtime if you want. I play with all these with people and see what's the effective mix for them when they're having issues. Obviously, you can reach in the prescription pad and go for things like gabapentin or trazodone if you want. But I, I really like to try to get people to be as functional as possible uh, and, and therefore utilize these agents first. MAG3 and 8, a big one to help people calm their brain. And uh, the other one, jujube seed, which a lot of people don't realize, this is extract helps with hipp hippocampal neurogenesis and neuroprotection. Uh, typically around 250 to 280 milligrams at bedtime is gonna work for that. Uh, and, and so it's just important to realize, I know I only had a few minutes, um, help people to manage their daytime stress, encourage them to do deep breathing, get them to do something that'll get their mind off the stress they're under, try to get them to reinitiate their circadian rhythm for sleep. And uh, I'm gonna let it go with that so at least we can answer a question or two. Thank you to our panelists for giving us tremendous insight into this topic. Now it's time to take a few questions that have come in. Can antihistamines help with coronavirus? Um, if that's for me, I would say no, because it may dry out the mucosa too much. Um, so uh, I would try and avoid antihistamines at this time um, for COVID-19. Now, that being said, again, if there's concern that you may have allergic rhinitis associated with it and you do take antihistamine and improve, uh, you, you pretty much uh, are on the right track. Some of the newer preparations might be of an assistance because it does have a tendency to reduce inflammation. But that, uh, that's uh, pretty minimal. So if you do have COVID-19, I would try and avoid antihistamines at this time. Um, I just wanna add one quick thing to that. So, you know, quercetin is an interesting one and I'm sure um, Dr. Laval will cover in a couple of weeks. But, you know, that one is interesting. They're looking at it as being a zinc ionophore, kind of similar to the hydroxychloroquine too. And then quercetin has a little bit of a mass cell stabilizing action also. We use yeah. a lot mast cell activation syndrome. So that one might be interesting to use really for the zinc ionophore and the mast cell stabilization. That would help kind of two birds with one stone in this set. Next question. What is the better treatment for coronavirus, an immunomodulator or an immunostimulator? I, I, I would I would say to be safe an immunomodulator. Um, the concern I think we all have, even in the um, the natural compound category, is uh, the exacerbation of a cytokine storm, and certainly uh, botanicals like elderberry or echinacea, even vitamin D, uh, might exacerbate a cytokine storm. And so while those things might be fine for, you know, sort of more benign infections like the common cold or even the flu, I would suggest against them in COVID um, because of this known phenomenon. And so you have other options like a plant sterilin, 
plant sterilins help to modulate uh, the immune response. Um, we also know just building uh, glutathione levels uh, helps to modulate the immune response. So taking N-acetylcysteine, for example. Um, so you have other choices that are a bit more nuanced. You will find in the letter that we send out uh, this week that you can send on to your patients, it includes both uh, recommendations for immune support, mostly immunomodulators, but also a recommendation to avoid uh, immune boosters that we're a bit concerned about. Yeah, and I think to add to that, you know, some of the medicinal mushrooms and other immune stimulators in addition to the one Andy mentioned, so I think definitely you have to be careful, especially in the sicker population, because they're more prone to the cytokine storm. So that's another group that a lot of people are using that are immune stimulants that may potentially cause problems. What I mean, one of the biggest things you can do, you know, pre-treatment is just try to get people eating healthier. I mean, one of the biggest things that triggers inflammatory cytokines is, you know, diets that, you know, influence metabolic syndrome and, and obesity, right? So you, know, you don't yeah. want to forget about that. And obviously things like thymus and alpha-1 or thymus extracts uh, actually can help just to kind of reinforce immunomodulation. Um, and, and then obviously the sterols and sterilins, I mean, what Andy was right on, I mean, you want to go for more things like, you know, IV extract for the lungs and those kind of things on the, on the, on the early onset side versus doing the strong, you know, echinacea, golden seal type of things, which trigger the, uh, you know, strong immune defenses. And sadly, we have a lot of questions, but we are out of time, so we must end the discussion here. I want to thank you again to our panel of experts, and thanks to all of you for taking the time to join us today. Be sure to tune in next week for week two of this series taking place next Wednesday, April 22nd at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a wonderful afternoon and be safe. Thank you. See you, everybody. Stay safe. Bye. Take care.